and welcome you all to this episode of In Conservation With. And I'm with a woman that, although I've only known her for about a year and a half, I think, I feel like I've known her for most of my life and maybe in the previous life as well. Uh, Erica McAllister. Um, before I Sorry actually... about that. <laughs> you have that effect on people, I think. Do you remember what <laughs> I said so to you? The... Do you remember the... what I said to you the first time I met you, Erica? Which version, the PG version or the... Um... It's the, the, the... Well, basically, what? yeah, yeah, that's true, actually. Um, <laughs> what I said to Erica, I met her um, a year and a half ago in Scotland at the Grant Arms Hotel, and it was um, the uh, Nature Writing Festival that, that's had, that, that they were having there, holding there, and you had your book, The Secret Life, Life of Flies, and um, someone introduced me to you, and I said to you, much to your horror on your face initially, I said to you, who are you and what are you to me? And then you looked at me and then all of a sudden you clicked and you thought, me and you're going to get on. And then that was it. The rest is history. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think we've been pleasant to each other at all in the whole time. I think we've been having a six-leg, two-legged argument ever since. Well, I must say you're winning. I'll just say how yeah. For those who don't know Erica, and by the way, before we even start all of that, let me just firstly thank our sponsors, Leica, uh, Nature and Birding, and also King's Place um, Music Foundation, um, who are sponsoring this as part of their Nature Unwrapped season, which is going to be until the end of the year, so that's really good. Thank you very much. And I'm also doing a walk on the behalf of, nature, uh, of um, King's Place, and it's called work, Walk with the Urban Birder. Just about to say, just about to say Work with the Urban Birder. Walk with the Urban Birder. And uh, it's going to be at uh, well, the actual, the actual uh, uh, links up there as well. King's Place, London on the 3rd of September. Okay, so that's um, the official stuff out of the way. Now we slip into unofficialdom. But before we even do that, let's just, get, let's just get a bit serious for a second. Let's just tell you who Erica is. She's a really hardcore heavy duty person and she's a senior <laughs> curator yeah honestly um go ahead yeah, totally <laughs> you're the senior curator curator for dipteria dipterra dipterra well you know tomato tomato um and um fleas <laughs> go on try it go on just try it siphonaptera siphonaptera yeah yeah, mostly working yeah. with the lower brachera, brachychera. <laughs> the brachycera. <laughs> this is going to be such an entertaining podcast. Sorry for everyone else, but it's just going to be. <laughs> um, chunky but funky flies that include the bee flies and rubber flies. Then you, uh, God, uh, myceptophilidae, philidae, yeah, myceptophilidae. Yeah. Fungus gnats, Coolicidae, 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 yeah. mosquitoes. Um, you carried out research projects with mosquitoes around the world and abroad. You've been, been you've been involved in on, on an ongoing, uh, God, uh, Acidae, 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 <laughs> Robber flies, Robber flies. Uh, project and you're currently working on a lot of other things so you're doing a lot of stuff at the moment <laughs> yes yeah well uh, when I'm not sitting at home in my shed yes now the thing is when I first met you I I didn't understand but I, I do know now know I've, I've, I've met the original fly girl but I didn't understand I thought you were joking at first when you said you were into flies um, um so yeah I it, well, I was going to ask you, can you actually tell us, all of us who, who actually don't understand or know you, um, how did the fly business come about? So I've always liked insects. Um, well, my, I, I love the outdoors. I was very much an outdoor, like I've uh, often fallen out of trees. And I no offence, but vertebrates, they were good, but they weren't amazing. Like... You know, you, you've seen one bird, you've seen them all. Obviously, that's not true. It's a little joke. But um, I was quite small and I fell out of trees a lot. And so I spent a lot of time on the ground going, ah, oh, 
but then I would spend a lot of time like looking around me. Once you start realizing that you have such a tiny bit of habitat, say in front of you, and yet there's hundreds of different things going on and hundreds of different animals. And it was beginning to realize that these little animals were doing all sorts of funky and amazing things. And so it was like, well, okay. But I wasn't um, an overly precocious child. I wasn't like uh, a lot of my colleagues who went around having an insect collection by the time they were five, they described every insect in the UK. I kind of been mulling along at my own pace. And um, I didn't even know you could be an entomologist. I didn't know what they were. Um, but I, 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 I was like, I know what I want to do. And I love biology and I like maths. So I carried on there. And then at university, it was like, do you want to do biology i really don't like humans <laughs> sorry so i was like i'll do environmental biology but because I, I didn't want to do environmental science because i wanted more science and biology and then i was lucky at university i met this man called dick askew now he may need nothing to a lot of you but to many entomologists he's like one of the top gods in the uk and he was the king of parasitica now i have a natural tendency to like everything that he's stabby piercy death maiming you know more fun things in life as i like to describe them and he used to he scooped up this pile of insects and he said erica that one eats that one that lays its eggs in that one that maims that one and i was like well that's it gonna be an entomologist now and so he and i was very lucky and fortuitous to meet lots of amazing people and i started off with the other i like to call them the lesser insects the beetles and the ants, and they were great fun. But when I got onto flies, I realized that nothing else could, could answer all the questions that I was interested in when it came to the environment. So ecologically, they are the absolute aplomb. They, they do, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much into this because it's part of my talk, but they are so funky with every aspect of both their form, their function, their ecology, that um, I just love them. They just genuinely amuse and stimulate me every day. Well, that's a very impassioned um, promotion of flies, I suppose. And you've written, well, you've written one book already, The Secret Lives of Life of Flies, and you've got another one coming out soon. Oh, look. Which is going to be the inside. Is it already out? No, I got given, funny enough, being an author, I, they gave me a book. So, and then look. I feel like an adult now. I feel like a grown up, look what I did. When you do a PhD, the thing about doing a PhD, I think most of it is to prove that you can actually do research for three years and not go mad. Now, a lot of your PhD, a lot of the research will never come to the public light and it won't actually be read as a thesis, it'll be read as publication. So it was hard, it was soul destroying. <laughs> Writing a book, was the worst thing I've ever done in my entire existence. Because suddenly realizing that people out there might read it was a bit of a shock to the system. So, yeah, I mean, you've written loads, so you must be quite used to it, but... The thing is, I've written loads, but I have not won an award for zoological communication by the, ZS, the ZSL. The Zoological so, of London. I have not won an award, so your one book has knocked out anything I've ever done. Yeah, but that was really weird. So they said, oh, we put you forward for this award. And I'm like, okay, let's have a look at the past winners. The previous year was Blue Planet 2. <laughs> so I'm like, brilliant. There's no way I'm going to win this. And then suddenly you're like, oh, a little book on flies next to Blue Planet 2. <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely felt like a, a David of the Goliath moment there. <laughs> Fantastic. It's interesting because my interest in natural history actually started with insects too. I was in the back of my garden, I made a, a zoo, I collected insects, um, I found cuckoo spit once and for those, would, would, for, for, would our colleagues in America know what cuckoo spit is? I wonder. They should do. It's it's a, I'm sure it's the same thing. Well, so it's called the same thing. I don't know, will our American colleagues tell us if frog hoppers exist in America? But basically... They do. They do exist, but um, different I'm sure they're still called frog hoppers. Anyway, the larvae is covered in this foamy stuff. I remember going out in my garden as a fresh-faced eight-year-old and seeing cuckoo spit and thinking, oh, great, a cuckoo spit in my garden. Um, 
so I was quite excited. But then, you know, I kind of moved on once I realized that birds ate insects. I thought, that's interesting. So I thought I'd follow those. But for you, you know, people who talk about insects, they're normally into moths, butterflies, dragonflies, out of push, maybe beetles. But flies, I mean, when you think of flies, you think they're annoying, they buzz around all the time, you know, they, they don't learn. You know, I'm sitting in the cafe, a fly keeps on coming, like the same one. I'm saying, look, go away, leave me alone. And it still comes. I could argue, yeah, I, I could argue that's exactly how I feel about humans. And yet, for some reason, we have to tolerate them all around us. But as we know with many humans, a lot of them are actually doing some really good stuff if we pay attention. So you're, you're picking maybe one or two species when there are hundreds of thousands of species out there. So I, I don't want to, and even those ones that you think are very annoying, they're actually been really useful to us for thousands of years. I mean, just getting rid of all the theses around us. We have to thank those little flies that buzz around our heads all the time, which is good. And um, no offense, but you've got a really nice shiny head. So you're very attractive as a landmark for mating flies. So <laughs> you just have to put up with it, I'm afraid. You know what, it's, it's particularly bad when I go to like South America or tropical countries. And it's just, I remember going to uh, Jordan last year and it was lunchtime and I was starving and I was in the desert and my guide gave me a sandwich and I held my sandwich up and it was covered in flies. And I was thinking, and I thought, I'm hungry. So I had to brush them all off and just stuff it in my mouth quickly before they got to it. It's fine, it's fine, you're still alive. As my mother would say, just scrape off the top and eat it. <laughs> We're all here, it's all great. Um, Actually, don't go rowing. Bald headed men rowing on a lake. That is the, the biggest visual cue that any fly can ever get. And there's some lovely images of men rowing and this kind of massive pillar of mating flies above their head which you know when they in cop as we call it when they're in mating together a lot of them would drop down <laughs> so you're just going to get hit by mating flies which is quite so you... Sorry, evelyn ross i realize i won't go more i'll stick at pg at this rate but it's quite fun is 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 um is it safer then to wear a hat like a baseball cap i mean is that better to do if you're, so you know the Australian hats with the corks? Oh yeah, yeah. That actually is legitimate because you do that with the corks and it actually disrupts the flies so they won't come near you. So although we came over and went, ha ha, those Australians are being daft, they were actually being quite clever. And thanks to COVID, I've got a lot of corks now if anyone <laughs> wants that. Okay. Um... Well, I think maybe we should just go straight into it. Let's know, learn about flies because I'm sure there's quite a lot of people here who uh, would be dying to know why they should love a fly. Um, I've been struggling okay. for some time, but one or two of them are quite pretty, I've seen, since, I was, since I've met you. I actually noticed more flies than I've ever done. Um, I let you know now, I, I always try not to kill them. Even the ones getting in your house, I, I always try and let them get out the window. But there's one very funny clip I remember one scene in Family Guy I don't know if you've ever seen Family Guy yeah there's a clip when because they always have these moments when they have these kind of uh, they just see things and, 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 and once they think see things they kind of cover a, a subject that happens in everyday life but they kind of make it to an animation it's quite funny and basically the family are downstairs talking and all of a sudden the fly comes down from upstairs and the fly speaking to itself saying right I think I I think I might go outside for a little for a little fly around, and it goes to the window, and one half the window is open, the other half isn't, and he's hitting the glass all the time, thinking, "I thought I thought there's a way out here. I wasn't wasn't there a way out?" And then everyone else in the room saying, "No, go to the other window, the next window, the next window, it's open." And the fly kept on going and said, "You know what? I'm going back upstairs again." <laughs> Which I was quite funny. Now, the thing is, they don't see glass the same we do. So it's not a clear panel to them because they see refraction because of the way their eyes. Plus, they also look for signatures. So they look, they smell footprints of flies past. So, you know, they always hang around in the lampshade in the living room. And you're like, why is there always a fly in that lampshade? It's because that lampshade smells of other flies and other creatures. So they go and taste with their feet 
and they pick up all these chemical cues and they see things differently. You know when they fly in that kind of like weird pattern around your lampshade? That is because of your creatures. Because that is one of the hardest ways for an animal to catch them. So birds can't suddenly go uh, uh, like that. So a fly just, this just looks really weird. It's like weird feng shui in my living room. So um, that's why they do that, to fly in such a staccato way to upset your ones. So there's a whole lot of different things going on, but we as, we as ignorant humans are not aware of all these things. Okay, well, please enlighten us. <laughs> right, shall I start? Okay. And, uh, yeah. Right, can you all see that then? Yep. Yeah. So, um... By the way, before, sorry, before you start, for those who want to see it full screen and not as part of a, uh, 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 you know, a gallery, there is a step you can take, which is, I believe, Claire, to go to your... What do you click on, Claire? You click on Speaker View, if you've got Speaker View up the top, if you're not in it already. And then you see it as one image and not as several. Sorry to interrupt you, Erica. It's all right. Yeah, I'm used to it with you. <laughs> so um, so I, I'm very lucky, as um, he's introduced, as David's introduced. So I work, oh, why is this not? Okay, at the Natural History Museum in London. And it's an amazing place. It's, 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 um, we have thousands of visitors. Well, we did have thousands of visitors every year. And a lot of people just think about the, the front of the house, that it's bones and stones. So you've got big dinosaurs, or you've got massive meteorites. But what a lot of people don't realize is actually there's 80 million specimens um, behind the scenes of which there's about 4 million flies. Now, I've been working there for about 15 years and I love it. It's great. I've been doing research all around the world. I've been meeting fantastic people. This collection goes back 350 years. I'm working on some of the most important historically, geographically, etc. specimens of, you know, globally. But what I've come to realise, oddly, is that nobody likes flies. So <laughs> I've got to a point where I was like getting genuinely fed up with having to describe it. Hence why I started writing these books to kind of get the information out there. And the first book was all about their, how, what their feeding groups are. Because flies, like all the best people, are obsessed with eating. And thankfully, they eat everything and anything, which is why they're so very useful. So the public just sees this fly all the time. They see all the house flies. They see the flies that hang around feces and rotten flesh. They're like, they're disgusting. All they do is regurgitate germs. And it's like, well, yes, they do, but actually they're very important for some other things, um, including pollination, which I'll get onto in a bit. But they are but a few of all of the described species on the planet. Now, mosquitoes are weird because a lot of people don't even think of mosquitoes as flies. And yet they are, are very important as vectors. We know this. There's 3,300 described species of mosquito, but of those, only 10 of them are globally important vectors. So there's a whole lot of other mosquitoes going about their business, doing things, which I'm going to explain in a bit, which we, we need to start to think about and understand. Now, the first book was all about feeding, but the second book is all about their mechanics and what they're doing. And so just looking at this fly now, straight off, you can see as she pierces through your skin, you can see this amazing thing going on with her mouth part. And luckily, thanks to us, we're now beginning to study them, not just for their biology and their behavior, but also when it comes to bio-inspired technology, which is, again, it's a new area for me, but it's where it gets really funky because we're, we're, we're starting to look at these things with different appreciation. So they get everywhere, right? The first thing everyone ever, ever told me about insects is that they're only terrestrial, they're not marine. Now, flies, basically have taken every blueprint you can do about them and tossed it up. They've ripped it up, they don't care. This fly is kind of a terrestrial fly. It's um, called Ephydra hyans, but it's also called the alkali fly, and it's a scuba diving fly. Okay, so this dives to the bottom of the mono lakes in California, where this is a female, where she lays her eggs. Now, these lakes 
are more alkaline than the sea. They, 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 because the way that the, uh, the, the lake has been formed, it's got no outlet. So it's just got saltier and saltier and saltier over time. No fish can live in this lake. Basically, it's a weird ecosystem. But these flies have managed to dive through the surface of this lake and then scuba dive down. This is an air bubble surrounding them. Now, this is really funky because they are, they're getting into the deepest lakes in the world. They're going up mountains. But we are looking at um, these scuba diving activities to whether we can do it ourselves so we can have these body suits and start going underwater, which I think would be so amazing. I'd love to be a massive fly going under the water. But they are, they were the first animals in space. They are the largest purely terrestrial animal in Antarctica is a fly. They, they, they basically laugh at all the, the structures in place on them and, and say, we can do it. There's a fly that goes to sleep for 13 years if it's in the environment is not suitable for it. So they do it every year. There's also a lot of them, as everyone can testify. So this is what we call a species scape. And each group of organisms are represented by the size of their, their model organism. And the insects are represented by a fly because there's more insects than anything else. And it, within those insects, four groups dominate. The beetles, the butterflies and moths, the uh, bees, wasps, ants, and sawflies, and the true flies, the diptera. And these four are called the mega diverse groups and they're amazing. They're, they're so important to the ecology of the planet. So a lot of you will recognize these. These are some of the cute hoverflies in the UK. And just to kind of give you an idea of numbers, there is over uh, 280 species of hoverfly in the UK. So, and there's more than 6,000 of these globally. So when you come to I think it's, um, is there 18,000 species of birds globally? So just this one family of flies is really species rich and there's a lot going on. And when people say that flies aren't attractive, I'm sorry, but these are some of the most adorable little creatures in front of you right now. So just in the UK with hoverflies, we've got 280 species. When it comes to the rest of the flies in the UK, we've got over 7,200 and 13, that was the recent estimate I looked up today, species of flies. So there's more flies in the UK than there are species of mammal on the planet. So you can go in your garden and what you can see in your garden will truly be like loads and loads of different species. You do not have to go on a massive safari unless you want to call your little garden explorations a safari as such. So Globally, I think we've described about 180,000 so far, but we know this is woefully inadequate because funny enough, not many people are describing flies. They're still working on the big vertebrates. Right, move over to the more important groups now, these ones. Now this is a screen grab and it's really interesting because it highlights one of the problems we have in describing flies is that common names are really bad because up here, one of these is not a fly in the true sense of the term, it's a caddis fly. So it's, it's the third row uh, to the right. So this isn't a true fly. And people will ask, well, why does it really matter? And, and it does really matter because if we don't know what we're describing and what we're looking at, we can't begin to help you understand its ecological function. It's really, really important. For example, Everyone goes on about bees, and I know there's a bee woman in the audience right now. And everyone goes on about how important the bees are, and like, yeah, they're saving the planet, they're the best pollinators. Now, don't get me wrong, they're good, but they're not the best. So here's, as this is what I do, I don't know if other people do it, I, I troll through the internet trying to find all these taxonomic fails where people give glory to all the other insects when really they're talking about flies. So I try and highlight to everyone what they're doing wrong. Sorry. So here we go, I, I make ice cream, I make coffee, I make broccoli, I make clothes. I don't know how they're getting this all out of the bee, but anyway. But the biggest thing they say is chocolate. Now, chocolate I hate, which is the entertaining thing about this. I think it's revolting. But you wouldn't have chocolate if it wasn't for flies, okay? So of the, I think we're now up to 17 pollinators of chocolate, 15 of those are fly. 
There's a tiny ant and a tiny moth that are not very important, but they still do it. But the rest of them are flies. And even better, the rest of them belong to basically, apart from one species, the family of biting midges. So that's Scottish scourge, the thing that everybody hates. Those tiny little noceums, those bitey annoyances, actually are very important when it comes to pollination. This is when conservation, we have to start understanding what's going on because they've started doing massive monocultures in Uganda and places like this of chocolate because of the global insatiable appetite for this revolting food substance. But they're doing all these monocultures and they, so they stripped out all the trees, which is really bad, many levels. But primarily because this little midge, the adults like to have the trees for their um, adult time. So they want a bit of discreet um, coolness where they are, but their larvae also live in the detritus. They live in this leaf litter made by these trees. So in clearing out these trees, you're basically wiping out the pollinators for this food source. So if you don't suddenly sort it out, if you don't start planting the trees, there's going to be no more chocolate left. Which I don't mind, but apparently you will. So the flies are brilliant as pollinators. They, they are, um, half the families that have been described so far are uh, pollinating, have got a pollinating species in it. Um, but what they do better than others is that it's not just the adults and flies that are really important, it's their larvae. Getting back to those baby bees, what does a baby de bee do? She just sits there, gets fat and lets it be fed by all its aunties and whatever and just sits there. But no, the flies, they're chucked out to work, okay? From the moment though, those little maggots have rigged out of their egg cases, they are doing something. Now this is one of the most common hoverflies in the UK. It's part of the Aristolani uh, tribe, it's an Aristalus, and its larvae have got all these rat tails. Okay, so these are the rat tail maggots. This is um, entertaining because it's an anal spherical, and who does not like a telescopic anal spherical? So this larvae feeds in decomposing matter. So it loves our waste, our sewage, it gets rid of it, but to enable it to keep feasting away, it breathes out of its bottom. Very good way of looking at life. So, but it has to get its little anal spiracle up to the surface to get through to the air. So the whole bit of their life cycle, their larvae are eating this waste, this manure, and the adults are pollinating. Hugely important. They're not the only ones that are really good at decomposing. This is the black soldier fly. And this arguably is, is transforming our farming systems, our agro ecosystems, and, and hopefully soon will help the exploitation of the fisheries, which is a huge task for just these little flies. Because their pupil stage and their pre-pupil stage, before they transform from that larvae to an adult, is dense in protein. 40% of their body weight is this massive protein, and it is great. So what we're doing is we can get rid of our waste by feeding it to these things. And these flies are not harmful to us as adults. So they get rid of the waste before those other harmful flies get in, such as your house flies that people don't necessarily like. But we can also feed them to our livestock. So we can add little maggot farms at home. And then the thing about them, they're very good at the pre-pupil stage, changes so it crawls out of the waste and hooks itself so you can um, auto farm them because they can just drop into a little container and then you've got animal food just like that. And what I read about today, which I hadn't even realized with these things, I think they're brilliant at everything, is that they're so fatty that we can actually, we're beginning to use them as a, uh, a self-actant. So where we've been using things like um, uh, palm oil and olive oil, we can now use these as a grease instead because they're so greasy there there's so much lipid in them as well so this could be another way that they help the environment so these little flies get everywhere they're stunning they're very easy to recognize they're in the uk and so next time you see them you can go you could be saving the planet they're predators um these are mosquitoes a lot of people don't like but they are very fun and the adults are pollinators Okay, the males are all, adult males are all pollinators. The adult females pollinate as well. She has to have a blood meal to provide protein for her eggs. 
the next time you kill a mosquito, just think you're killing a mother who all she's trying to do is look after her babies as best she can. But anyway, people do want to get rid of them. But what is quite fun is this picture here. You've got a big mosquito that is feeding on a little mosquito because there's a group of mosquitoes that are vegetarian, both of them as adults, and whose larvae like nothing better than eating other mosquito larvae. I have a story about them in South Africa where I went trying to find a specific type of mosquito and hadn't registered. I got one of these big fatties in my bowl. And the next morning I came down to one massive mosquito larvae, obviously smug that I'd given it a load of food and it ate my beautiful species that I was trying to find. So we can use them as biological control agents. Your garden, like I, I, since COVID, I've been massively living in my garden. I've gone straight to doing loads of vegetables and I'm having an absolute nightmare with cabbage white butterflies, which I think are evil, and aphids. But luckily, those hoverflies again, a lot of them, this is in the uh, different tribe, it's a different fam subfamily, um, they like nothing better than sucking the insides out of aphids. Now these are brilliant. There's some um, called the marmalade hoverfly, which is very common. There's lots of them. And they're not only great predators of all the things that are eating our crops, they're also massive migrators. And between one and four billion tons of hoverfly turns up in the UK every year. Now this is not only good for all the crops and all the plants along the way, of, in terms of getting rid of the pests, but it's also hugely important in spreading those genes around Europe. So little relic populations of plants, which have got no other pollinators around them, these hoverflies are so high up, they can go, duh, 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 I spot plants over there, let's go pollinate them. So they're really good at transferring these genes across Europe. And then back again, it's something we're good at exporting outside of the UK. That's my only political point. They're, the predators as adults are brilliant because they are part of, a lot of them are venomous. We don't think about flies being venoms, we think about all the bees and wasps, so yeah, they're all the stabby pisses. No, flies are unique in their venoms. They have evolved venoms independently. They are so different to the rest of the other insects and other animals that are venomous. In fact, this is a group called the robber flies. And I like them because a lot of them have moustaches, even if they're females, which is quite fun as a female of a certain age. But their venoms, they've got 10 new venoms. They've, this family is called Acilidae. So the venoms are called acillins. Very exciting. So you now know 10 venoms because they're called acillin 1, acillin 2, acillin 3, and so on. But six of those are absolutely unique to this family. Like they, they haven't even got a common ancestor. So we're like, why? what's going on? Three of them we know that are closely related to neurotoxins. So we know like unlike spiders, which are dissolving with um, a, 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 uh, uh, a uh, digestive enzyme, these are neurotoxins. So we know these are paralyzing their prey. And there's some brilliant papers about 100 years ago talking about a man who used to cut up bits of insect to try and paralyze. And it's, the experiment is grotesque and interesting and fun. And it's, I talk about it in the next book. And here you go, thanks to, I mean, this is great about why flies are, it's more fun nowadays as well, because we have so much imagery associated with studying these creatures. So in here, we've got an SEM, uh, sorry, yeah, scan electron microscope. And uh, you can see the mouth part, the proboscis, the kind of sword shaped thing. And then we have a, a section through, and this was made by computer tomography. So you could scan through the organism and we can see where the venom glands, which are in the shoulders, and you can see the pumps where it comes through. So they've got all these different pumps going on, inject it. It's a, it's a fascinating and complex subject for only just being getting into. And why this is useful to us is actually a lot of flies, mosquitoes, think about it, when they bite you, you don't realize they're biting you at the time. Because actually all of them are injecting a tiny, tiny bit of venom to paralyze the skin so it doesn't respond, you don't have an immune response so they can feed safely before, uh, before you realize what's going on. So we're starting to think about in medicine how we can use all these sorts of funky adaptations. Um, I love a parasite, who doesn't? They're lovely and these are, you can see on the right picture, there is a fly, yeah it's got no wings, 
got no halters, it's blind, and it runs around on the backs of bees. That's a honeybee you see in that photo. And these are amazing ectoparasites. In fact, they're kleptoparasites. They um, basically, they get rid of the food around the mouth. They're like, come down. So the queen's like, ah, food all over her. And the little flies come down. But this is a conservation issue because we want this fly out in the UK, mainland UK. Because actually, when we put those neonicotinoids, um, sorry, the miticides in the hives to get rid of the varroa mite, didn't get rid of the mite, but he got rid of this fly. But people don't value flies. They don't value these species as important as other species. This is one that lives on bats. This is so cool. And again, it's got no wings. It is it's completely different form and function to what most people think about with flies. But again, it's quite specific on the bat. It's quite important. And this, which lives actually as larvae, those things on the left, this lives in the inside of a rhino. So now we're talking about critically endangered species. This, whenever it's World Rhino Day, I hashtag World Rhino Botfly Day, to kind of highlight the importance of all these other creatures that have got a unique habitat. The stomach of a rhinoceros is arguably that. But if you lose the rhino, you lose these. And does one species have more of a right to exist than the other? Don't think so. And so I think we need to get to that. These are so, the adults are so hard to find because you have to get fresh rhino dung to look for the larvae. And that's quite an extreme habitat to go sampling behind. I'm not allowed to let students do it. There's a lot of students. I think it doesn't matter for the greater good of science, they can do that, but that's not a thing. So it's very interesting when it comes to conservation of flies. But I will finish with this little story about um, this group of flies called forids. Uh, I, um, as a, one of the women online, she's been giggling at this because we were talking about this. We call these horrid forids, and they're only called horrid forids because taxonomically they're a bit of a challenge to identify. But ecologically, this family of flies is the most ecologically diverse of any family of animals on the planet. You name it, they do it, they eat it, they live there. They are extraordinary. And these ones specifically, this little lady above, that's her ovipositor. You can see sticking out the back of her abdomen. It's kind of like a tin opener because what she would do, she would fly down to this ant's back and she would slice it open to shove her egg in. Yay, what a mother. Now the egg hatches and the larvae crawl through the thorax into the head of the ant where the larvae, larvae will just eat for a couple of weeks. It will eat everything that's going on, all the cerebral mass everything else in the head and the ants carrying on la -di da because we know a lot of them they don't really do a lot of their own individual thinking they get told a lot of things to do but after two weeks the uh the little larvae is happy and it wants to pupate so it releases a digestive enzyme that causes the neck to the collapse and the head falls off so the group of flies here we call ant decapitating flies because that's what they do now this little fly has a perfect little habitat in which to pupate safely in now and then bish bash bosh, out pops an adult fly. Now this may seem slightly grotesque and slightly horrible until I tell you that's a fire ant and we have no natural anti-venoms against ants and fire ants can live in colonies of tens of thousands and are very, very invasive. So in North America they're causing massive problems. Now these flies only kill that type of ant. So we can raise these flies and release them and they will go out and try and get rid of all these ants for us. So it's really important, again, uh, how we, we look, and how we study all these fantastic. So I want people to start looking at them. They're beautiful, they're fantastic, they're shiny, and they're adorable. Come on, look at them. And so this is what hopefully these two books we'll try and get through to people but there's so many other amazing resources out there about why flies are important thank you thank you so much erica um listen zoomers you must have questions because there are some interesting uh things talked about and i noticed that some things you didn't talk about because i've heard you talk about other things in the past elsewhere but i can understand why so um, if there's anyone out there who'd like to ask a question, please 
feel free. I mean, one question I want to ask you um, is, Erica, have you had a species named after you yet? Yeah, robber fly. So it's quite nice. And hopefully there's another bee fly coming. So I quite like the idea of being a predator or a parasitoid, eating the insides out of things. So I'm not sure my mother's overly proud, but I am. <laughs> um, I believe that little Evelyn's got a... Uh, Evelyn, have you got a question? Evelyn? Well, hello. If, if Hello. you read my message down the bottom, <laughs> once there was this, there, once when we went to this park type thing, well, it was somebody's land, but we just walked past, and they would, I'm <laughs> sure she would let us in, but there, there was these, there was a swarm of flies following me about, and well, whenever I lay down, they, they would sit, they would sit on my t-shirt, and yes, oh. I've seen bean flies in my garden before. Bean so, flies, yeah. Yeah, sorry, oh. speak. <laughs> I love a bee fly. Well, the thing is, um, it depends on your colour, what you're wearing. Are you wearing a yellow t-shirt right now? White. 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 So they were, they were certain flowers they're naturally designed to go for, and they have to learn cues. So innately, they're generally attractive to yellow. So if you don't want a lot of flies around you, just stick away from those sort of colours to start with. But also blame oh, your parents on me. <laughs> she loves it. Oh well, then wear them. But blame <laughs> your parents on how many flies come to you, because the number one reason is genetic. So they will like the different cues, the different smells that you have, made generally because of how, what your genes are. So why must do you get bitten by mosquitoes? No, I I I saw. I do. <laughs> well, right, so do you know I, what blood group I, you are? I, sorry, but. You I, tell about your nurturing your mosquitoes. Yes, I'm looking after mosquito larvae <laughs> in my garden already, and one's turned into an adult, so so I picked it up and it, it didn't suck my blood, it just sat there on my fingers staring at me. <laughs> well, the males will come out first, so next time have a look. If they've got fluffy, like a feather it, dust, it is, it must be male, but it had to stick That's out. a male, hmm. but he's probably flirting with you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I do have pet bugs at home. I have pet mealworms and I have pet locusts and I have pet cockroaches. We've got flower chafer larvae, haven't we? Yeah. We? So oh, you're a little entomologist. Yeah. Good. Big, big entomologist, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know the, the Latin for the bee fly, don't you? Bombylaris major. Yeah. Yeah, you see, David, see how she pronounced that? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your observations and questions. You're welcome. Thank you. Are you enjoying it tonight, by the way? Yes. Good, good. <laughs> um, Erica, have you ever caught any diseases from flies? No. Which is, um, I, I really want a bot fly, which I don't think that quite counts, but... Um, most of my colleagues have had a bot fly one way or another. And um, these, these bury through your skin. The subdermal. Did someone say anything then? The thing and, is, um, I was just going to say, I've heard many horror stories from, of people who've had bot flies. You know, they've, you well, know, uh, I would tell you some real horrors because I've read a lot of medical papers on this. And as a man, there's one that will fill you with absolute horror. But because the audience, remind me to tell you over a beer sometime and you may need to go and find a dark room because it is quite traumatic. But I thought it was fascinating. But my friend, um, um, when uh, he got one in Peru in his back and when he was, he had to get the plane over to Thailand and he lost it. So he must have emerged mid flight which must have been fun for the cleaning up of the aeroplane. But and I, and malaria, which well, considering I spent a long time trying to collect mosquitoes all around the world, and especially ones that transmit malaria. No, I, I'm not attractive to insects. Um, I've got the wrong blood group to start with. What so is it? I'm, I'm, 
Well, I'm a B. So because I'm quite rare as a blood group, being B, uh, mosquitoes are more used to going for O. So if you're all O, then they're going to go to you more. They recognise the smell better. So it's a bit of an uh, O here moment then. Mm -hmm. So you've got to blame your parents for your genetics first because that's number one, blood group. Um, males drinking beer. That's a good attractant for mosquitoes. <laughs> pregnant women. Um, now, not being a male drinking a beer or a pregnant woman or having the right blood group, they've just basically gone to everything else and they'll eventually come to me, I guess, going, come on then, let's have your blood now. David Howden, you have a question. How are you, sir, by the way? Yeah, I'm good. Hi, David. Hello, Eric. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just thought, there we go. If, if people, you know, inspired by, by your talk, want to now start learning more about flies, identifying flies more, what would you suggest people do to get into it? Because the fact you've told us there's 7,000 in Britain is absolutely terrifying. Right. <laughs> that's, well, that's, no. that's a really hard don't panic because there's an amazing organization called the Ditris Forum. Okay. Now, uh, fly people are, are especially keen to get other people involved with flies. We, 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 we didn't have any friends. And so we're like, yeah, come along. Now the Ditris Forum is a really well set up, cheap and properly organized organization. Go online. We do a journal and we do a really good bulletin. Plus we run training courses. So uh, we have hundreds of training courses all around the UK that are set up by, I don't like the term amateur because these people are, know way more than I do about every fly. And we have some of the world's best experts here in this country. And what we do every year is we develop new handbooks, new guides, and plus we have lots of mentors. So you just go on, you know, you can join, people give you advice, you can find out where you were. Um, social media is brilliant now for this. So we have um, some really good fly experts online, both on Facebook and Twitter, who are able to identify your photos, point you in the right direction. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a, there's so many good things coming out of the Dipshits Forum and what they're organising. I thoroughly recommend it. Excellent. Well, I sorry. Yeah, well... I'll always try to do things. I mean, I mean, I do moths as what I do, which I know you think moths are a bit you know, boring for Zeke, but you know. Um, we do, we do, we do flies, flies turn up and, you know, might try and work out what they are. So that, that sounds really useful. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you do moth trapping. You must get a load of flies in your moth traps. Yes. Yes. I, I haven't got anywhere to dump them on at the moment, so they tend to get let go. Oh, yeah, see, <laughs> you, you're getting, you should really study those because they're really important. You get a lot of crane flies. There's a really good crane fly recording scheme. Mm. There's, a, there's lots of new resources. It's fabulous. Excellent. I will check some of them out. Good. Thank you for your question, David. Um, one question, another question I've got for you, um, Erica. Um, you think of flies as being sort of dirty and disease spread, as you mentioned it previously um, in the beginning of your talk. Um, how infectious are they? I mean, are they, should I say? Because when I'm at a restaurant or anywhere and there's flies buzzing around, I'm forever trying to pat them away, but you know, push them off, thinking about the moment they stand on my food, I have a problem. Is there a sort of, does it have to be on your food for longer than X amount of time before you're in danger? Or um, so, you're talk so they're mechanical vectors as well as they will be able to, in their crop, have, depending on what they've fed on, we'll be able to transfer some bacteria. Um, again, um, it's the cross-contamination issue. So if, if you've got rotten food or rotten fecal material, whatever, close by, they're transferring. So if, if the environs have got everything properly, everything that's bad covered up, then even if they land in your food, they won't be transmitting anything to you. So um, a lot of them, won't because a lot of them are quite specific so you may get some fruit flies that land on your fruit and uh and vinegar flies because they're two different families and they are only attracted to fruit so they are not going to be walking on your feces or your decomposing animal flesh type thing so uh, you know it's going to be quite small and no offense people well maybe now they've got slightly better but you're handling money and you're handling other things which have got far more um, 
well, how do I put this politely? They've got a lot of issues associated with them. So us as humans are quite filthy and we're prepared to touch each other. So yes, flies are bad, but in perspective, I think we need to be a little bit more, more easy about them. I, I, um, I generally just, well, I, I'm, I know probably a bad example, but I would just watch, it's terrible. My partner's like, oh God, Erica, can't you just be normal? I'm like, sorry. Because the thing is, I mean, when I'm somewhere, even in Spain, you know, you're sitting at a cafe and there's flies buzzing around and I'm doing this every five seconds. And some people just sit there and the flies walk on them and it's fine. I can never get used to that. I can't handle a fly walking on me. When I'm birding in we, shorts and something touches my we, leg, um, I'm going mental. I, uh, one of my colleagues got married and so half the wedding was like civilians and the other half were entomologists. And you could really tell the entomologists because everyone else is screaming about the wasps and the flies. And half the group were just sitting there, just picking out these things in their drinks and carrying on. It was just like, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're just quite naturally used to doing that. Claire um, Evans has asked, what's the difference between a, a fruit fly and a vinegar fly? Or okay, so a proper fruit fly is in the family to Fritidae and uh, they are closely related to Drosophilidae, Drosophilidae, which are the vinegar flies. Now, whenever we learn, anyone learns genetics, they learn it as a fruit fly, as Drosophila. So it's a common name that's been banded about badly. Um, so Drosophila were the model organisms, they're the ones we've done all the inherited diseases, all that research, the behavioral ecology. They've also, um, they've got, <laughs> So want to tell you a fact, but it's so rude I can't. Uh, they're very interesting. Tapritids are the ones that are agricultural pests in some way. So the olive fruit fly, the Mediterranean fruit fly. So you would have come into contact with that. And the females have got this amazing ovipositor, her egg laying tube, which she can pierce through the sides of fruit. So that she's got a really nice distinctive bum. That's the main difference. Uh, it's all about bums. And uh, in terms of flies, what is the, the biggest fly? There's a family of flies called Mydidae, and they're found in Central and South America, and there's a, well, there's a well, Mydid that's about that big. So it's quite big. You get crane flies that kind of so like have legs. Is that again? Hmm? How big is what you're talking about? Yeah, big. About um, eight centimetres long. So, but it can be slightly bigger. They are enormous. They take about five years to develop, but the adults don't even feed. They haven't got functional mouth parts. So it's five years as a larvae just stuffing their faces. And then they have a couple of weeks of being an adult and doing adult things. What's the benefit? What's the, uh, what is the biological benefit of being an adult for two minutes? Why can't you just become a juvenile all of your life, a mate, and then just produce other juveniles? Well, you, you want to have sexual reproduction. So basically, you're getting up to everything. You're building up to dispersing and reproducing. So you want to be the best disperser. You want to get away from the rest of the population in many terms because you want to get to new food resources. But you also want to be the fittest that all the ladies want to, or males, want to copulate with you. So it's really important that you're the best at that stage. So there's, um, you know, flies are the biggest flirts on the planet. They have so many body ornaments all over them. There's some groomed flies that have flags on their abdomen, so they wave. They've got abdomen flags. There's a lot of flies that have got the, the ornaments, like the horns, like deer, so they will headbutt each other. So some of them have got, uh, sorry, Evelyn, they've got willies that look like tiny curly whirlies. Okay, and there's all sorts of flirting going on, and they will do all sorts of dancing and whatever. And so they need to have enough resources to make sure this stage, they are like, yay, got to get them. Yes. Uh, David Howden's actually begging to hear the stories that you were reticent to tell. <laughs> well, maybe next we time. Hmm? Maybe we can do it afterwards <laughs> in the after show. <laughs> in the watershed moment. Uh, one more. Uh, you just, okay, so, sorry. What are you going to say? Well, I was going to say, next time you're having a drink in the pub, just keep your hand over your pipe, just saying. 
Um, one more question before we kind of uh, get to the end of the hour, and unless someone else has got a question, of course. Mosquitoes. Um, okay, there's 10 species that effectively bites us out of the X amount thousand. If they were eradicated from the face of the earth, would it make a difference to the actual right. diversity? This is a question mosquito experts ask a lot and is asked of us a lot. Now, um, so arguably these 10 species have such an impact on humans and malaria being number one. Now malaria doesn't always kill, it's some, it's, but it can be very debilitating. So if people within a family have malaria, suddenly they become dependent. So suddenly people are looking after them. So it's not just how many deaths it causes, it's what it does to the, to the local communities where you have so many people with malaria and being so dependent on it. And so it's like, okay, we can get rid of this. This will help millions of humans out. And yes, it will. And then you have other examples like, hold on though, but if we get rid of it and we get rid of all these mosquitoes and they're really important, what about the other impacts these mosquitoes are having? So in food webs. So what happens to all the wildfowl that feed on these mosquito larvae? What happens to a lot of these plants that need these mosquitoes to be pollinated? And well, and that may be a small part, but the biggest thing is insects adapt quickly. So if you got rid of these 10 species of mosquito, there's probably others in the wing waiting to come in. So in fact, getting rid of these 10 species may not help you, you may just transfer the problem. So what I would like us to do, and I, I hope this is the route we're going down, is actually breaking the disease transmission. So don't get rid of the mosquitoes per se, Get rid of how malaria is transferred into you. And if we can start doing that, we can start being clever about these species. We can actually get rid of the, 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 the organisms inside the mosquito that is causing it to be problematic. Because I don't think we're ever gonna get rid of mosquitoes. We've been trying to kill these little ladies for a long time and have gotten nowhere. What is the best way of deterring mosquitoes? I mean, all of Hang us- Hang around with someone who's more attractive. Say again? Hang around with someone more attractive. So, I mean, it depends where you are in the world. Uh, so Africa, a uh, huge success with bed nets, okay? Uh, and the dominant species that are carried malaria because these ones were feeding at night, okay? I went to Indochina, you go around all around there and you've got malaria, but it's spread by a different species that feeds dusk. So they were like, hold on, let's all have bed nets. No, bed nets won't work here. And the problem is public health needs to kind of, our message needs to get across properly. People need to understand that those of different species doing lots of different things. And so our understanding of taxonomy, of species, of ecology has to grow before we can start really having an impact on these human societies. Okay. All right, well, the other question I'd love to ask you in this first part of tonight is, uh, what is your favourite invertebrate? Well, obviously it's fly. Now, I only have 180,000 to choose from. Um, so, uh, so uh, I, in Scotland, it's Lefria flava, which is the, uh, it's, the it's a robber fly and it is adorable. It's a vicious predator and maims and kills and dissolves the insides out of other insects, but it's very fluffy. Um, obviously the Bombilius major, the bee fly, I mean, who doesn't like a parasite like that? And what is adorable about this is the larvae go through two completely different stages. It kind of goes through an active toddler stage, where it runs into the nests of these uh, bees, uh, ground dwelling bees, and then it becomes total teenager it kind of blobs out and just wants to eat and uh, so and then as an adult it's like yay look at me I'm fluffy and I pollinate and I like to have lots of fun and I'm like that's the perfect life cycle for me if I could come back as a fly probably come back as something like that okay and um were it not for the uh, the pandemic we're currently in where in the world would you be right now I would be doing field work in the Caribbean, which is, yes, I like being in South London rather than the Caribbean. Oh, yes, I do.
Zoomers, just to let you know that tomorrow nothing's happening. You're having a break to digest what Eric has told us. <laughs> um, but on Thursday, uh, join us again because Dominic Cousins will be here. Um, he is a, a famous writer in the UK. Uh, he's also a bird guide, but he writes lots of books. He's written a thousand books. And he's going to be talking about Britain's garden birds. On Friday, I got a good mate of mine over, uh, Jen Brumfield. She's from Cleveland, Ohio. She's a great laugh. And she's going to be talking about birding and rarity hunting, but also talking about her uh, work she does, outreach in terms of talking to kids, especially African-American kids, and getting them into nature. And the final, final um, in conservation move of this season until October will be with a lady called Polly Morgan next Monday at 10.30 a.m. BST, which means our American friends, unfortunately, unless you're having a late night, you'll be kipped up be asleep so you, you may have to see the recording but she's an artist who uses um, animals in her art she uses um, taxidermy actually she's not even a taxidermist she taught herself um, so it'd be really interesting because her work sells for three figures sorry six figures even um, to people like Charles Saatchi and all those guys so that's what's coming up um, at this point you know what's coming I'm actually going to be saying to Erica my good friend I've known for all of my one and a half years that I've known her. Thank you very much for being here tonight and sparing your time, because I know you're a busy woman. We've been trying to get her to come for several months now, and her agent just says, I'm sorry, but you know, the flies come first. So I'm glad that we had, we had the list tonight. Thank you. It was good fun, thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, Zoomers, as ever, thank you very much. I, uh, <laughs> what? I'm sorry, Evelyn's waving a grasshopper at us. Oh, okay. I can't see you, Evelyn. But anyway, Zoomers, thank you very much for, for being here tonight again. Really appreciate your company. Um, hope you've learned a lot like I have tonight. And there's going to be more in the after show. But until then, look after yourselves in this, these troubled times. Keep, keep looking up and also around for the bees and the flies. Actually, not the bees, the flies. And at night, listen out for the mosquitoes. <laughs> And hopefully I'll see you again soon. <laughs>